Welcome to God Talk from Chaplaincy at CCCU. Today we welcome Clemma Ankrow from the Healing Springs. Um, Clemma is an Ali Moy of CCCU and has since gone on and does other things. So, Clem, you graduated from here in 2017. Um, what have you been doing since then? Mm, um, 2017, so I um, went on to um, do a master's at Cairns. And, and first of all, I'd like to um, thank you, um, B2, for, for having me and um, the team that you're working with, Jeremy and, and um, AJ. I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. It's an amazing work and keep going. Um, so I, I went on to do an MBA at um, Kent. Um, so that lasted for a year full time. And afterwards, I went back into work um, because prior to coming to study theology, I was um, heavily involved in education and training. So I was involved in delivery of um, back to work programs, especially projects and programs for the hardest to reach within communities. Um, so they're mostly government funded projects, um, the apprenticeships, um, vocational qualifications. And um, I was the director of trainer recruitment of um, Middleton Murray. So Middleton Murray is a big training provider um, in London and Kent. So I went in originally as a business development manager that went went on to develop their training arm. Um, so um, after taking a sabbatical in 2014, I think after completing theology, then going on to do an MBA, which was something I've always wanted to do, I thought it was time to go back into um, industry. So I got a job with the GOC, General Optical Council. I was working with them reviewing the um, standards for opticians um, and that was a really interesting role. Um, so I helped produce the first draft of the new standards. So I was working with universities, colleges, um, private organizations and, and pulling together stakeholders and getting um, their, their views and their needs and aligning them with what the expectations were in terms of um, the GOC as a chartered body. Um, so once the first draft was completed, uh, I moved on um, and I went on to work with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So again, doing something similar, but this time we were not doing um, a review. This time I was working with the various um, countries that, that we delivered our courses through. Um, so 44 countries around the world. Um, the timing was quite incredible because I remember during my interview, <laughs> I was asked um, what what new ideas I'll, I'll bring on board. And I said, oh, I think it's high time we look into di digitization. And this was like December um, 2019. And, and they said, oh, that's a brilliant idea, but I think we'll pack that for now. But come <laughs> March, they were like, ooh, <laughs> did you say digitization? I said, yeah, I thought I said that. Yeah, and I said, okay, well, we had to. We had to move really quickly um, to move all the courses online. Um, and ensure that you know that the, um, 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 the lawyers uh, that, that were doing the courses had access to mock exams, had access to training materials, um, assessors had access to. So it was a huge project. And um, uh, moving on from that, I'm now with the um, Office for National Statistics, again working with the Black um, African community in in um, Croydon and and Merton. Um, um, mostly informing them and encouraging them to be involved with the census. Um, they are classed as um, um, key population groups. So we've got a number of groups. So we have the older folks, we have um, we have ethnic minority groups, we have those in IT literate, and so they're not. So I'm working with one of the KPGs, which will, um, which is in this case the Black African community. But the interesting thing about it, with, with the lockdown and COVID, <laughs> everything's been done online. Uh, this would have been a, a truly exciting role, going about, you know, working with local churches, looking, working with local faith groups, mosques. And, and, and local community organizations trying to um, encourage them to encourage the members and people that are involved in what they do to be involved in the census. Well, however, we've had to switch online. Um, so now, we're, you know, uh, we're, we're doing desk-based research, trying to glean and pull to get the spreadsheets of local organizations, sending out emails, um, trying to arrange Zoom meetings, and um, hopefully um, post 2nd December things will, will, will slightly 
normalize and we'll get to meet real people again. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's me pretty much. And um, on the side, I also have a social enterprise. I mean, interestingly, I mean, when, when I joined the theological um, 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 department, uh, well, well, came in to study theology at Christ Church, I was I was a pastor, I was a local pen, um, Pentecostal pastor in Bexley at the time. Um, dare I say I had a, a huge afro. No, that's a lie. <laughs> no, um, yes, I was I was pastoring in that church. And um, I think for me at the time, I felt, you know what, to, to really add value to what I was doing, it, it'd be it'd be good to 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 do um, a, a degree in theology. I've always wanted to to study theology. And um, so it was brilliant. I um, really enjoyed my time at Canterbury um, and, and it really informed uh, most of the work I do now. But perhaps most importantly, it helped me to really explore faith by myself, um, obviously through the various essays and through various lectures um, and, and um, brought me to a point where I'm more at peace with myself. And, 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 and I, I would say it's the best investment I've ever done. Um, it, it gave me the opportunity to explore lots of questions that I guess at the time the church could not answer. Um, so I, I, I went in a Pentecostal pastor and graduated a dazed. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. I leave my faith um, through the work that I do through the social enterprise. Um, and at the moment we are working with um, developing, um, in, working in developing countries. So working with NGOs and SMEs um, to help them um, improve their products and increase the the economic um, revenue that they get for their products. So a, a, a classic example, um, we're currently working with um, makers in Rwanda. Um, so they make um, flip flops, accessories and, and little bits like that. And we've engaged them, bought products off them. So again, increasing cash flow, which seems to be one of the major problems in, in, in the developing world. You have these artisans and makers that's really struggling hard to, to make ends meet. Um, very innovative, very creative people, but the cash is not just there for them to expand, employ more people and, and, and make the impact that they, they could be making. So the idea is that Healing Springs will buy the goods off them. We sell the goods offline. So again, they have access to cash straight away to, to feed their family, pay their rent, and then buy new resources to, to continue what they're doing. And through the, the, the e-commerce website, we also generate a bit of revenue that we use to keep our cooperating costs running. But most importantly, it's that the whole work is underpinned also by a workforce development. So I've got two volunteers at the moment um, that are working for us. One, one of them is a web developer and the other one's a business analyst. He came over here from Nigerian scholarship and he's, he's working with us, doing some phenomenal work, um, especially the, um, the web developer. He's been with us for about well, three months now. So we have a workforce development element, which is the human capital element. We're working with these individuals, coaching them, mentoring them, um, exposing them to technology. One of the things that COVID has really revealed or exposed is the di digital divide um, around the world. It's incredible. Um, just working with these guys, especially the one in, in, in Nigeria, you know, the, 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 the struggle just to communicate as we are now you know, so easily. It, it's incredible. I mean, but also we've had to be very innovative. We've had to use WhatsApp. We've had to use other means to just get um, things done. Um, he's developed two websites for us already. And um, he's currently working on our social media platform um, with a view to, to market those products that we are selling via the website. Also, we, we've established contact with an organization in Sierra Leone that works with orphans. Um, as a result of the Ebola crisis and um, also the um, war that that um, um, happened in the 90s. So he's engaging these young people through a farming project. He's been leased um, a huge portion of land by the government. And they're, 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 so they're planting their crops, engaging these young people. And the, the other important thing about this project, especially, is the fact that it reduces brain drain because these are the same young people that we see on TV 
trying to travel down to Europe, um, some drowning, some dying in the process. And this young man, incredible young man, is working with them, engaging them and ensuring that they don't leave the shores, but stay on ground, try to connect, you know, create a community um, that serves as a family, but most importantly, use that as a means of passing on very useful skills. So um, it's, it's really tough, it's exciting, and uh, I, I really enjoy um, um, the, the work um, with, with Healing Springs. So again, just to recap, so we have the, the work we do with the NGOs and the SMEs. So like the, 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 the example I mentioned with, with Sierra Leone, with the guy in Sierra Leone, it's called um, Yes Sierra Leone. So that's an NGO. So we're working with them, um, coaching them, developing them, help them with business plan, help them with funding, um, completing um, funding applications and, and, and um, also coaching SAR. I'm coaching SAR directly and helping him to shape the ideas and move things forward. Um, so that's one aspect. Then we now have the other aspect, which is the workforce development, where we get in volunteers to, to help design websites, help, you know, develop projects within the organization. Um, so that that's me pretty much, yeah. So that's what I've been doing. So I know because I've been involved with you with a little bit of Healing Springs, and it, it's an amazing concept to work with NGOs, to work with SMEs and everything. And obviously with your background is you're well aware of the divide, the, the have and have not divide. And I mean, depending where you are in the world, that divide exists in the UK. If you look in a wider aspect, certainly if you were to compare the UK with Nigeria, then you're talking about a massive difference between have and have not. Absolutely. Um, so I know we're, we're going to talk a little bit about weaponization of poverty. Do you want to quickly outline mm. how you view weaponization of poverty? Because I know in, in some ways it's used in one term, in America it's used slightly different. Let, let's try and build a, a ground plane of where we're going to go with this term. So do you want to outline the term? Absolutely. Um, I, I think to, to give it more context, it'd be good to look at look at um, the, the, the Christian Bible, for instance, um, in, in I think it's, it's in the book of First Kings or Second Kings 6, there's this interesting story of a king that um, besieged a city. And um, when, when he besieged the city, he cut off all the supplies. And as a result of that, there was farming in the land and, and people were stabbing. And then the, 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 um, the, the, the writer went on to explain about two, two women that, that came to an agreement and say, oh, you know what, we're, we're, we're both going to die to death. Um, why don't I, why don't we eat? Um, your child today and tomorrow we eat mine. So that just paints the picture. But but the key thing here is to look at how it's been used over history. It's not a new concept, although it's been really popular in the last three years. Um, it's It's been used through history in the military sense to besiege cities. Um, you cut off the supply, you put the people under enormous pressure, the people are vulnerable, weak, and you, you manipulate them and take advantage of that situation. Oftentimes, when you besiege a city, there's non, they're, they're most likely to be internal revolt. So if you're a good strategist, you know, you just leave the people to destroy the elites. Then you come in and you take over. Because after a while, the people get fed up and say, oh, you know what? You need to sort out a truce with these guys. We're dying here. We're starving. And so, so, it, it's a, so if we use that... As, as a scaffold, for want of a better word, then we now we now move that to the social dimension. We now move that to the political dimension. We now move that to the economic dimension. dimension. So a classic example, we see that um, with, with, with slavery. Um, you go in, you enslave, brain drain, you get the best of a tribe, and you're left with left next to nothing. The people are vulnerable. They can be manipulated. Um, because the whole idea, it's about power. It's about manipulating using using poverty, which is a social um, and economic situation. You now use that desperation to manipulate the population. 
Um, so so that that's pretty much where, where this concept comes from. Um, and, and we know that poverty um, has various dimension. Um, there's this poverty in the United Kingdom, there's poverty in America, but perhaps the poverty in Africa in itself, it, it, it's in a complete, well, I wouldn't say completely, it, it's, it's relatively um, worse off. And we have um, elites and, and people in government but I don't think they've actually intentionally designed it to be that way. But it's one of those unintended consequences of greed and corruption. Then you quickly now realize that, oh, as a result of this, we now realize that, oh, not many young people think it's sensible to go to universities anymore. Because why? Because, you know, they, 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 they know an uncle or an aunt that is a professor or lecturer that is as broke as everyone else. Oh, you know, you're better off um, doing um, politics or and, and, and joining the corrupt people or doing other things. Um, so things like the arts, you know, um, um, and, and, and these are very important things that uh, are important in, 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 in shaping the cultural fabric of a society. And these things become completely irrelevant. Um, important things like education becomes irrelevant. Important things like wisdom in the community becomes irrelevant because at the end of the day, it's not about how wise you are. If you're wise, show me the money. <laughs> yeah, if, if, yeah, that, that's 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 the measure of wisdom. So show me the money. If you can't show me the money, I don't want to listen to you. Um, so weaponization of poverty has various dimension, and we see the impact, perhaps most importantly, in the developing world. Um, where, you know, um, during elections, for instance, you know, people will be just giving food to vote. You know, how powerful is that? You know, literally giving grain and say, oh, if you vote for me, you get grain. And this is literally food for maybe a week. That meal, they, they sell their vote, they sell their rights. You know, how powerful is that? Um, but also we see in, 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 in America, for instance, even here with Brexit, I mean, some scholars argue that poverty, especially in the northern part of, 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 of England, was weaponized and, and used to, to sell the idea of Brexit. I mean, you know, various people have various position when it comes to why or why or why not they don't they wouldn't want us to leave. But if we, if we leave the politics aside and just look at how people manipulate it, I mean, we know from the data that some of these um, places were places that benefited the most from the funding coming from Europe. Um, and but at the same time, they were manipulated. And th this whole idea of, oh, if we bring power back, we will be able to do more and empower you and do this in the communities and do that in the community. This whole idea of divide those at the bottom against each other to maintain a status quo. And it's interesting because even with the French Revolution, the second revolution was based on that. You know, you had the the the, the elites, well, that, 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 that sort of, because of greed, wanted power, but they used the, the working class um, um, to, to move the revolution, the revolution. And in the end, you know, they got back into power and they restored um, King King Louis, which, which, you know, the cousin of the former king. So again, you have a revolution that went full circle back to status quo. And we know how it ended. In the end, Louis had to leave and um, another revolution happened again. I mean, in America, many argue that America is going through a revolution. Um, like it or not, Trump has a huge supporter base, and these are people who worship and adore him, they love him, and um, he is weaponizing that and um, promising to fight, you know, against China on their behalf and I'll bring back jobs from China and stuff like that. Like, hey, people get happy, and um, in the end, you know, when, when we look at the data, I mean, what are these people really getting? Um, so, so that's that's pretty much. I think I've covered all continents now on, on, on this <laughs> idea. <laughs> I, I think that's a really interesting point with Trump because Trump is a really good example. Trump managed to 
manipulate, immobilize, whatever the term you want to use. I mean, academics will argue about these terms for years to come. But people that generally wouldn't have voted for him. People were voting to lose jobs in the belief of what he could do for them. I mean, there's one of the great ones, isn't it, was the steelworks that he visited in the Rust Belt. I forget exactly what steelworks it was. Yeah. And he promised them all massive pay rises and everything and put pressure on the company to give them pay rises, which the company then did, but it forced the company into bankruptcy and they all lost their jobs, which is a classic example for me for the weaponization of poverty. You take something that's unobtainable, you use your um, X or your, how can I put it, your vocabulary, your digital manipulation skills. Your, your and, and religion in the case of Trump. Yeah. You know, religion, you know, the, the, the evangelical, um, especially evangelical um, Christians, you know, are hugely, hugely behind him because for them, you know, he's the Messiah. He's the one that because they, they've come with come up with this idea that um, God, God has to do some work in, in, in the world before the end time. And Trump is championing that work, you know, and. Anyway, <laughs> but, no, but, but I mean, that's a really classic example, isn't it? If you look at the evangelical building of property in the Golan Heights, then again, that is a classic weaponization of poverty, is you're using your power, your money, to build in a deprived area Absolutely. in order it's to achieve the goal. Yeah, yeah you're placing it. So would it be fair to say that the motivation behind it is always power? I, I can't think of an example where it isn't power, ultimately. And it, would you argue that? It is power, but ultimately there, there are also economic benefits from it. So um, power, uh, it, you know, a classic example, if we, if we look at, at Trump again as a case study. So he's, he's a very wealthy guy, he's from a wealthy family. Um, but he, he comes across with his working class rhetoric and, and people bite, you know, I'm, I'm in the trenches like you, you know, I feel your pain. He, he does not feel their pain. I mean, if anything, I mean, if we, we look at it in terms of political uh, um, 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 figures, I mean, if anything, Biden and, and, and Kamala Harris are more working class you know, I'm more likely to um, associate or connect with these um, um, people that are really behind Trump. But again, it's politics. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, the things also I gained and I really enjoyed was doing communications while at Canterbury. Um, so, you know, I did uh, combined on it. So I did um, theology, um, media and communications. So um, and, and we learned a lot about, you know, how you spin, how you can be economical with the truth, for instance, how you can engage audiences um, and, and manipulate. You know, there was this very interesting workshop we did at the time when we um, looked at Norm Chomsky's and manufactured consent. Um, I, I remember that was an epiphany for me and I was like, wow. This is really serious um, and, and, and it goes and it's around the idea that even consent when we say yes when we say no oftentimes it's not even our original thinking oftentimes these are manufactured and they're manufactured through advertising they're manufactured through the media um, and the media are gatekeepers and it's the reason why we see very wealthy people often investing in the media. People don't get it. They think, oh, what's this big deal about, you know, wealthy people and the media? They know, they understand that the media, the, the print media, but also the digital media, even now, you know, the likes of Facebook, gatekeepers, you know, Google, the, the <laughs> enormous, you know, power that they have. Um, in terms of manufacturing consent, 
you know, um, advertising, you know, um, and how money controls what we read. Because adverts are paid for. And technically, these adverts actually maintain these, well, sustain these companies. And and so so they, 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 they and that decides what is newsworthy within these organizations. So there's that every every uh, media house um, has you know news values. So from their news values, they, they decide what is um, newsworthy. So you know you don't see the whole structure, the whole system, and the likes of Trump, you know, using social media enormously because the 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 well the institutional media, if we want to use that term, um, it, it it couldn't leverage, it couldn't um, exert pressure or control them as it wanted to. So he broke away from that and used social media again on that one to one. Um, basis really micro bringing it down to local needs and local um, challenges and and selling those ideas to people so power definitely um, hence the reason why it's called the fourth estate you know information is really powerful um, but but perhaps most importantly it's the economic benefits in the long run that they get from it um, so it's mostly political uh, economic um, benefits and just to maintain that status quo to keep the people for want of a better word where they should be just keep them there keep them there so i mean facebook's a really interesting case study again isn't it i mean i know we've talked about trump but let, let's diverse let's go to facebook so facebook the of facebook are designed to send you adverts randomly paid for adverts that appeal to your social, economic, political group. So if you've got someone like Trump who then puts out an advert on Facebook, you click on it, that leaves a cookie or, or something in the Facebook system that then triggers you to get more and more of those adverts. As you get more and more, you you get more. That, more. That's, that's, that's manufactured consent. And if memory yeah. serves, when Noam Chomsky discovered this or, or he, he actually built in it it's from i think an original idea in the 60s or 70s and he built in it when he when he when he came up with it and, and built on that theory it was still slightly far-fetched i mean people could see with print media how that was possible but perhaps it's even more evident now with social media i mean going back to the point you made you know with these algorithms that are designed to look at our searches believe it or not they look at the kind of things you search and use that data to send you information they look at your work um, the kind of people you share information with the kind of information you share the kind of information you like and and but but what i think perhaps a danger with that is this bubble social bubbles that we create in. I mean, a classic example, and I fear we don't um, go through that in the UK, but we can see with America how divided, I mean, unbelievably divided America is. I mean, just just going on Twitter and just, you hear some, I mean, we laugh about this, don't we, sometimes, Peter? You know, you hear the, these comments and you think, oh my God, this is unbelievable. You know, the myth, the, the pseudoscience and all this information that people genuinely believe, you know, and 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 and, and using this information, you know, uh, and religiously to pursue the gains, the aims, um, and I just hope and pray. I mean, that we don't get into that in the United Kingdom. I think we we we're, we're slightly different, but. You know, I mean, it's often time we, we we see it's like the shadow of things to come, isn't it? And and it, it's often a classic example was was Europe. Um, you know, during the French Revolution, um, the French Revolution happened, and over time, everyone was overthrowing their monarchies. You know, no one saw that coming, but it was just a matter of time. And you know, a, a lot of people are worried and and hope that what happened in America just stops in America. And um, 
and the likes of Biden and Kamala Harris are able to just address and pull the nation together really quickly. It's all right for people to disagree on ideology. It's not a problem. I mean, that's how we 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 improve as humans and we get better at what we do as a people. Um, but the point of which where people now call to arms and start attacking and, and killing and 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 you know yeah it's it, 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 it's worrying that is worrying so, i mean if we look at companies like ring TikTok, um i'm trying to think you know 5g internet of things companies are worth absolute fortunes before they float on the stock exchange these companies have never made a penny they float on stock exchange and they are worth billions at the point of flotation which is absolutely ridiculous. But I think the thing with those is it's the algorithms and the data scraping in the background. That is the big business. And I mean, we know that data scraping is the biggest business in the world. No one is interested in you really as a person, but what they're interested in is your data. So for ring when you come home and you put your lights on you've got your wing lights you put your lights on if a village constantly does that on average at five o'clock every day that's amazing marketing power that's amazing marketing power for both the electricity companies and for advertising because we know then we have a prime time to target people you know so this is what data scraping is about on the other hand, there's a really nasty side to these algorithms that isn't data scraping, and that is to actually penalise people. Um, so, if you look at the benefit system in the UK, we know that we have algorithms running in the benefit system now, and we know these aren't fail-safe algorithms. There are grey areas in every decision, but an algorithm can't have that grey area. So would you say that that is another form of weaponization of poverty, that these government companies can invest? So Experian Credit is a classic example. They own virtually the whole credit check of the UK, mm -hmm. and yet you can't go and look at the algorithm that you can get but you can't look at the algorithm and how that decides your report will be interpreted. So is that another form of weaponization of poverty, would you argue? Uh, I, I think with the UK and, and also with America, um, to, be, to be honest and, and to be frank, I think even Trump, if he could wave a magic wand, it would want those people to 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 be a lot, you know, more secure in terms of work and all that stuff. Um, it, 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 it would, you know, it wish you could roll back the time and, and, and bring those factories back to America and all that. But the thing about life, as we've realized, it goes in one direction often time. And we, we hardly come back. Um, and even when we come back, it's, it's often short lived. So going back to to your question, it's I, I I don't think the government intentionally weaponizes poverty. However, they well, but that said though, I think in developing world it's that there is the element of intentionality because they know. But I think in the West it's slightly different. In the West, it's more around unintended consequences that are exploited. So, so I mean, we, we know the devastation that the, the, the recent lockdown and the pandemic has, you know, done to the economy. And it's in the interest of any tax-based economy to want people to be in work. So, so taxes can, or, or, or to own businesses. So taxes can be paid and, you know, the police be paid, the nurses and all that. So I, I, I wouldn't say that that the benefit, benefit system is being weaponized as such. And also, with my work working with the communities, I mean, I've spent a very long time working with the hardest to reach in communities, um, doing basic um, 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 workshops like interview skills, um, working on CVs, 
encouraging local employers to um, offer them placements, offer them apprenticeship opportunities. And I know the government invests, invests a lot in that area. I mean, a lot more investment. We could do a lot more investment in that area. There's been a lot, lot of investment in apprenticeships, in back to work programs um, to, to encourage people, even um, business startups. In some cases, there have been funds um, around business startups. So in the West, it's not really in the interest of the government to impoverish a community that that, you know, that, that's not. But however, going back again to the Brexit example, if the opportunity is there for political reasons, they will exploit it um, pretty much. OK, so unintentional. Could, I'm, I'm really interested in this one because, mm. as you know, in Kent, we have gone against the national trend. We have swell, which unfortunately now holds that horrible distinction of being the highest number of COVID cases, the fastest rising number of COVID cases. And one of the problems really in swell is people can't afford to be sick. They're, they're very low income families, they're mm. on zero hour contracts. Um, if, the, if they can't work, they can't afford for universal credit to come through because most of them have housing benefit or other credits, which when you apply for universal credit stops. Now I'm going to throw it you, Matt Hancock today said that the people in Swell particularly mm. are peculiarly unusual and outliners because they still go to work when sick. Now, if you can't pay your bills because you don't go to work, mm. then surely there's a weaponization of, of form here, or, or do you think that's a very poor choice of wording? I think it's a really poor choice of word because if, if if anything, you know, it it's the it's it's the employers that benefit from that, not not necessarily the government um from from that situation. And it's a sad situation. It's a sad situation that, you know, the people that um need the support the most are not getting it. And it, it's a shame that um in, in the country where health is, is free at point of access. We have people that cannot afford um, to be ill and take time off and get treatment. Um, but again, you know, exploring the, this whole idea of weaponization, if anything, it's mostly the fringe parties that benefit from it. Um, so your UKIP, your um, BNP and, and, and parties like that, they're the ones that often manipulate um, these situation, as we see see in America also. I mean, America is a classic one because even people within the Republican Party all of a sudden have a Republican Party that they can't even recognize anymore because Trump has moved them so much to the extreme that there is even likely to be a breakup. So in terms of the UK, um, we, we've had clever politicians within the Tory party that went in and used Brexit to bring back all those fringe voters at UKIP and BNP and all that, bring them into the fold. But it stops there. Um, once they're in the fold, they would want them to move up. So in terms of social mobility, um, to, to get jobs and, 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 and move up. Um, but I don't think it's in the interest of any government in the West to want people to just stay poor. Because it's really costly and expensive, you know, violence, um, policing becomes an issue, housing becomes an issue and all this stuff. So it's yeah, it, it's it, it's a shame that I, 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 I didn't see that. My Hancock. I mean, why would he? Anyway, I'll leave that. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of time. So just one more thing that I want to throw out there. Yeah. Um, and this is looking, you know, in the terms of the world, we've covered lots of continents. Um, and I think we'll all agree that, this, that the African continents are probably the hardest hit, closely followed by Latin American continents, um, particularly looking at Brazil at the moment and the way that the government is manipulating there and how much they very much base themselves on the Trump model. Now, one of the really interesting um, points really is that a worldwide expected GDP turn turn down after COVID of 30 to 40 percent. 
and a real term real term income drop worldwide mm. of some 70 percent i mean these are just absolute massive figures if you look at nigeria as you know 90 percent i think it's 90 percent of the population no it's higher isn't it 98 percent are living under a dollar a day yeah that's the 2019 yeah mm. Mm. Yeah, she, if you then take that down to 70 cents a day, yeah, it, do you see that weaponization of poverty is going to increase or is there a way that we can push back against it? it it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one because um, whilst people, whilst, you know, we, we don't want to see a revolution and, and people take to the streets and um, start destroying little infrastructure that you know exists in these countries. It, it's almost I- inevitable that the, 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 the rate of poverty might lead to that. And perhaps even more damaging is the fact that now with social media, you know, um, way back, you could stay in your in a village. You 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 might not even know that you're poor. You know, you live your life and and you die a peaceful man. You think, oh, this is my lot. But you know, you go on social media and you see the standards um, of, of 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 life of people in the West, for instance. Um, you go on TV with global television now, where where you can go on CNN, you can go on all these programs. So increasingly, people are seeing the disparity. Um, so we have a generation that are acutely aware of the level of poverty that they're experiencing. But also, um, from a religious fun- standpoint, you also now have a generation that are acutely aware of this idea that, oh, it's okay, all fingers are not equal, which used to be you know the, the good old story um, even in Europe with the monarchy and you know the 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 um, be, before the monarchies were were, were moved most um, in most cases to constitutional monarchy in some cases republic it's this whole idea oh it's okay you know you're poor you're born poor that's your lot you know you'll have a better life in heaven anyway so it's okay you know just just carry on like that and serve your masters and you'll be good but you have um a young population that's saying, sorry, no, I think I need a decent life here before I get to heaven. So they're asking questions to their pastors, they're asking questions to their vicar, um, asking really hard questions that, no, we can't rely and and carry on with the status quo. Um, I need to lead a decent life while I'm here. Um, if I get to heaven, I'll, I'll get to heaven when I get to heaven. Um, but also, there's the um, population boom in, in, in Africa. Africa has the the the, the um, biggest amount of young people, and you, so you have young people, highly talented, um, no opportunities. What would happen um, with the recent pandemic? The, the you know the lockdown. I mean, the good thing about sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, the, the various um, explanation as to where why COVID has not really um kicked off as you know you know people were hope well um the medical um fraternity was thinking it might <coughs> get to um so i would say sub-saharan africa has been lucky in that respect however as we know now we have a global economy so regardless of the debt rates there is still a massive massive impact on the economy um, we, we have multinational companies that have branches in Africa. We have companies that outsource um, um, to companies in Africa, and, 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 and that domino effect, it's it, it, it's 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 gonna really shake the continent. Um, change has to come, but ideally, change through reforms. Because if it's if it's a revolution, it'd be it'd be really really terrible. Yeah. It's it's lots to take in, isn't it? And I'm sure you and I could go on for hours and hours and hopefully we'll come back to this and we will go on some more. But I'm conscious we're time limited today, so give other people an opportunity to hear other voices other than mine. So I invite the floor to uh, 
to open up with some questions or maybe some points to come back at Clem and see where the discussion takes us. Your mics are muted. <laughs> hey, hi. Oh, hi, Colin. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. That was very interesting. I didn't know how much you've done, you know, in the theological world. And um, I think actually I did enjoy. Um, so, so sorry, very... Colin. Could you just introduce yourself before? Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, my name is Kola Akimali. I'm actually a good friend to. So Clement, um, we, I think we got to get actually another opportunity. And um, I think what interested me so much in coming on today was the um, the work we're actually doing in Africa. I think we have um, similar uh, interests. Mine is more purely from a business, financial freedom, sort of economic uh, support and enhancement point of view. Um, you know, you you touched on a lot of good points there. I mean, my background was in investment banking. I was at Barclays Capital, managed a group of traders, and and we know how much money they make. And uh, you know, you talked about um, you know that there's there's definitely financial disparity um, between what's happening out in the developed world and what's happening out in Africa and the other third world countries. Just the way things are, um, but I think. The what I like about what you're doing, Clement, is the, you know, the interest in in trying to support some of these um, countries in Af uh, uh, countries in Africa that are trying to and come through the challenges. I mean, I have a Nigerian background to myself, 200 million uh, over there. Those who are sort of rich, uh, probably less than five percent, I think, and the rest are not sure how to qualify them. So. That's that's something you know that that concerns uh, a lot of us as well, and the hence why you know I sort of left my job, and uh, from January I'll be spending more time in Africa teaching the youths how to trade. So on their phones they can trade the forex markets, which I do and teach. In addition to that, is an opportunity as well to invest and um, make sure that in you know even the man in the street can actually have a play in making the the naira work with the dollars. And then, you know, parts of Africa as well. So Rwanda is an area that interests me only because in my team at the moment, I do have a number of Rwandans who are, you know, they're actually, you know, they're their colleagues and business partners. And the whole idea is how much, how can we give back to Africa? I mean, there's a lot that's been taken over the years. Um, we know the, you know, we know the history of slave trade and, and we're not going to go there. But the point of the matter is, it's not a matter of what's happened now, it's a matter of what are we doing now to address what's going on. Now, we are not responsible for the political, because a lot of the countries in Africa has been victims of bad government. And this is, I'm not a politician, but the fact of the matter is they have been, but the opportunities are there. They're smart, they're probably intelligent. They have, if they had the same backgrounds that you and I have, I was privileged, and so as you, Clement, who have been born here, you know, and we have, we, we probably can dance on both sides of the fence. But what we see in Africa does give us concerns, and hence we have to try and do a lot more in that space. So I really do respect what you're doing. Um, you know, I said you and I need to talk away from here, what I'm doing, how, you know, we can do something. Um, you know, if we are making this much money in what I do, then how can we leverage that and, and give the man and woman in the street a chance out there? So, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm open to what we need to do. So we need to talk a lot more away from here. Uh, I'll probably leave, let others also have a chance to, to say something. But thank you so much for inviting me. I really did enjoy this afternoon listening to you. And, and the presenter as well, uh, Mr. Pete. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. So thank you much just being said, Darren. I've just seen a comment from Jeremy about the, the importance of education and education learning to critical thinking. So perhaps you could bring two points together yeah. and bring some thoughts to that. Absolutely. And and as I alluded to earlier, the sad thing is, especially if we look at if we look at the context of the developing world, the sad thing is because poverty has been we weaponized so badly, um, education is not really appreciated anymore. I mean, we have people that actually, you know, just pay their way through university. You know, the lecturers are so broke that they will take money from, you know, um, students to to do, you know, essays and assignments for them. 
it's it's that bad. Um, so it's it's about a cultural shift, mm-hmm. and how that's going to be achieved um, in itself is a challenge. I, I once had an idea of work. I don't know if you've come across Coursera. So Coursera mm-hmm. is an online platform um, that originally started, I think, started about five or seven years ago. So what they do, they provide a platform for educational providers to put their contents. And these contents are accessible to people, especially in the developing world, for really, really, um, sometimes they even offer scholarship. Um, it, it's, it's a charity. And so we have Avid, MIT, I've done courses on Coursera. And I had a model where Coursera could be used um, to develop, um, to deliver courses. So working in collaboration with Coursera, there could be hubs. And these hubs could be points in which, you know, there would be um, solar panel generated hubs where people can come and access courses, where workshops can be delivered on courses, and people can be encouraged and, and, and exposed to a level and quality of education that's independent from the politics on ground. Um, but again, like every phenomenal idea, you need um, money and clouds to move that forward. So definitely education has a huge, huge, huge part to play. Um, but, but it's sad when the value of education itself has been damaged intentionally by the elites. I, I think you hit on something really interesting there, isn't it? And that's the separation of politics and education. You know, this is, is what we see in John Henry Newman's idea of a university is that you go, for those who are privileged to be in a university environment, especially in the West, we go to university as part of developing the person. The education comes second because it's, it's part like developing the person. It's part of freeing the mind to question, not to take answers. So, you know, relatively you read a newspaper and you go, right, okay, so what's the political motivation behind this? What's the reasoning behind what's what's the viewpoint behind this this article? Mm. And I think that's really important. And I think that, as you say, is probably one of the biggest pushbacks there is. Absolutely. To mm. develop that critical thinking, to get people to look at something and go, why am I seeing this? Why am I reading this? You know, if we could just start with 15 to 18 year olds on Facebook going, why is this advert suddenly randomly in front of me? What is that yeah. telling me that someone is trying to manipulate me to do? Absolutely. But the, the priority is probably the belly for now. <laughs> yeah. they, they need food first. <laughs> but, but is there a reason why you can't have food and have that at the same time? I mean, that's maybe that's maybe something to go away and think about. It's it's at the end of the day, it's it's the money. It's the bonds. You know, we 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 have a pool. And we need, and it's it's about starting small, and that's one one thing I've realised with the work I do with Indian Spring, just that that small, and and, but but also I think the the full thing it's there's a lot of short term ideas. I like the idea of empowering them to buy food for themselves and provide food for their family. So again, through through what we do at Healing Springs, where we buy the goods of them, that improves their cash flow. They have that money to pay rent, feed the kids, and buy new resources to continue the work they're doing. But in some cases, even employ an extra hand to meet the growing demand. Um, so once that has kicked off, then we can now have a hub where we can do short courses on improving your business and managing your cash flow on banking and you know maybe microfinance and just create an ecosystem that is sustainable. Um, not a situation where we keep asking and asking and asking people, but doing things that kicks it, um, sort of like has a domino effect and it just carries on um, increasing or improving. Um, I think that's a better model. Um, so, so for instance, we don't ask for donations as such. I mean, people are free to give donations, but we'd rather you buy these products that we're selling. Yeah, and that cash flow goes back into buying more products 
from oil. So it's it's almost like an Amazon for for poor makers and traders in Africa. But but you also relieve the dependency on it, don't you? Because they're not dependent on you coming and dumping money in and expecting something back. I mean, this is one of the known problems with the aid model. Absolutely. Watch compared to how we look at aid models these days. Um, anyone else got anything else? Because I'm conscious that we we have really run out of time, and I don't want to keep Clem. I know he's very busy, um, and graciously given up given up his time this afternoon. So, is there anything else anyone would like to bring to the conversation? No wall of silence. You've either stunned everyone into silence <laughs> or left everyone behind in your wake of intellectual knowledge. <laughs> they probably had enough of my voice like oh that's okay now <laughs> no i've really enjoyed this i think um yeah we should do it more often um i yeah yeah i'm, I'm I, I love giving back to community so i think this is one of the many ways if i'm privileged to um to give back and and well done again peter and, and jeremy i mean you uh at, at aj you guys are doing incredible work um it's it's truly a labor of love um canterbury will always have a big place in my heart um for many for many reasons please join us again for god talk when we will continue to look at what it means to have a lived faith <laughs>